so thrilled that we've had so much um, uh, uh, my content already uh, in this class. And by doing that in this particular round of the lecture series, we're getting to see different facets of um, how to think through uh, what, uh, what does it mean not just to be bi in terms of a bi identity, through the world with that bi identity, but also what does it mean when um, bi is expressed through culture, through spoken word, and today uh, through legal policy and policy advocacy. And, and so I'm really happy that uh, today we have with us uh, Nancy Marcus, who is an out bisexual lawyer uh, and who will be addressing the importance of bi plus inclusion in LGBTQ rights advocacy, uh, while also addressing the reciprocal problems um, and harms of bi plus erasure in LGBTQ law and policy work. Uh, she is the uh, legally bi columnist for bi.org co-founder of Bylaw, the national legal organization, author of numerous articles on LGBTQ rights, bisexual jurisprudence, that's the one, uh, jurisprudence, the constitutional law, and racial justice, and has held numerous leadership positions in the LGBTQ plus movement. Um, she grew up in Memphis, where she re rejected all efforts to turn her into a Southern Belle. Uh, let's give a big round of applause. Okay, let's see if, um, can you hear me? Do I, do I need to hold the mic up to my mouth or can you hear me right now? Okay, great. Um, well, I am thrilled to be here. I'm so glad you had this lecture series. I wish there were more of these across the country, especially ones that are inclusive of bi issues. Um, and indeed, that's what I spent a lot of my career as a law lawyer and legal advocate doing, is working to help um, improve bi inclusion in LGBT rights discourse. Too often in public discourse, in the media, in the LGBTQ community itself, and in our legal battles in court, um, and legislatures across the country. Things are framed in terms of gay and lesbian, or more recently, gay and trans, but the bi is very often completely omitted. Why is that? Is it because there are so few bisexual people out there? I have a feeling you know the answer to that one because you already had some bi lecturers. Uh, how big is the bi population? How many people here think that out of people who identify as lesbian, gay, and bisexual, um, Fewer than 10% identify as bisexual. You guys already know the answer to this. How many think it's between 10 and 25%? You've had some good lecturers. <laughs> How many think it's above 50%? Right? You've learned this. 52% of the community that identifies as lesbian, gay, or bisexual identify as bisexual. Um, and that's from a recent Williams Institute survey. So, the thing is, you wouldn't know that the majority of LGB people are B um, from the visibility of bisexuals in media coverage, advocacy messaging, or impact litigation, because bisexuals are rarely spotlighted as a significant demographic in the LGBTQ community, um, even though we comprise five million people in the United States. But we get virtually zero funding and little recognition compared to lesbians and gays. Um, and as such, some have come to describe the bisexual community as the invisible majority. For years as a bi-legal activist, I've worked towards trying to help dissolve that cloak of invisibility, particularly in the context of bi-inclusion and LGBTQ rights and discourse. And today I want to talk to you about that work and why it's important to work toward improved bi-inclusion, um, particularly in queer advocacy. So in this lecture, I'm going to talk about four topics. First, why bi, the importance of bi plus language in describing the non-monosexual demographic. Second, the history of bi erasure. Third, why bi erasure matters, the harms of bi erasure. And four, why bi inclusion matters, the benefits of bi inclusion. In the first part of the lecture, I'm going to introduce myself to you as a bi lawyer, or as I've dubbed myself, a bi lawyer. Um, I will also introduce the importance of bisexuality as a legal category and a valid identity. 
Um, I'll spend, I'll explain why I spent years of my career fighting for bi-inclusion in the legal world and the importance of bisexuality is an umbrella concept when working within the legal system for change. Second part of the lecture, um, I'm going to talk briefly about the history of bi erasure and describe some forms it's taken over the years, including bisexuals too often being strategically erased from the face of LGBT rights litigation um, and legislation. Litigation, I mean going to the courts, trials, hearings in court. Um, legislation, of course, I mean, you know, bills that go through the state legislatures or Congress and become law. Third part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about the harms emanating from bi erasure in the legal system including both harms to bi people and to the LGBTQ community more broadly. And then in the final part of this lecture, I'm going to talk about the benefits of being inclusive. I'm going to talk about how, at least in specific legal contexts, bisexuals can actually strengthen LGBT rights arguments. Um, I'm going to explain how bi inclusion benefits not just bi's and other queer folk, but by inclusion also adds to the overall integrity and cohesion of legal protections in a more general sense. In short, it's my hope to be both a bi bridge and to illustrate how a broader bi bridge in LGBT rights work can benefit us all. So, talking about how I became a bi lawyer. The reason I want to start telling you more about myself is because the issue of bi visibility and inclusion really is both personal and political. They're very much intertwined um, for me as they are for many people. I first came out as bi when I was your age, when I was a junior in college. Up until then, I'd um, been pretty boy crazy. I kind of assumed I was straight. Um, and then in college, I fell in love with a woman for the first time. Completely took me by surprise, but um, I embraced it immediately, came out as bi, and I've been out as bi ever since which is more than a quarter of a century. <laughs> I can't believe it. Um, but of course, as is too typical for us bisexuals, the first woman I ever fell in love with would not date me because she knew that I dated men. Um, several years later, I was in law school. I found myself the only out bisexual law student in my law school. And that was the year um, the first major LGBT rights decision came out from the Supreme Court called Rumber versus Evans. And I'm going to talk about this in more detail, but Romer versus Evans was a decision that it simultaneously affirmed LGBT rights, um, but in the process erased bisexuals. And I'll explain more about that in a minute. But that was the first of many occasions when I found myself in this kind of contradictory, dizzying position of celebrating a wonderful development in LGBTQ rights, but still grieving that bisexuals were thrown under the bus in order to get that victory. And I haven't been silent over the years about that juxtaposition. Over the years, through my involvement in the LGBTQ rights movement, I've increasingly had a voice in fighting both for LGBT rights generally and for bi inclusion in the LGBTQ rights movement. And in that respect, I have had a unique role and uh, I've enjoyed a really rare vantage point in um, being able to be in the middle of LGBT rights history generally, but also by history. So in my work, um, I did create the first ever national organization of bisexual lawyers, law students, law professors, and we called it Bylaw. And uh, as a law professor, I was a law professor for several years, and I wrote a number of legal articles and amicus briefs on the importance of bi inclusion. I spoke at the White House when we had a president who actually welcomed the bi community to the White House for a few years in a row. Um, and um, a number of conferences over the years uh, imploring people to be more bi-inclusive in their advocacy. But in the end, there are too few of us out bisexual legal professionals in the movement. And while I've had greater access to the LGBTQ legal community than most bi-activists, I still haven't had nearly enough opportunities to improve bi-inclusion in the movement. So over the years, I found myself having to settle for crumbs instead of real progress in improved bi-inclusion. And recently, my career has led me in a different direction. I've kind of retired from full-time activism. But for a good five years of my career, it was a primary focus of my work. And for decades beyond that, volunteering, um, trying to help bisexuals become more included in the movement. So what motivated me to get involved in bi-inclusion? Um, I had worked for decades as a volunteer for the LGBTQ rights movement. Um, I had a number of leadership positions, 
board of directors, that kind of thing. And I had written a number of briefs on same-sex marriage and articles before, 10 years before it became a reality, predicting how it could happen, kind of giving a blueprint for how it could happen. And my work was actually used by the briefs um, that the lawyers submitted to the courts. So I really did help in the movement to secure e marriage equality. And yet, <laughs> as a bisexual, I still felt like a second-class citizen, even though I was in the middle of the movement and, and helping out. So for example, I was on uh, the steering committee for the, my local HRC organization. They had a day where they were dedicating the whole day to a workshop on improving diversity within HRC. And at one point, I said, OK, in the name of improving diversity, I just want to kind of out myself as bisexual. I know a lot of you probably assume I'm a lesbian, but actually I'm bi, and I can kind of help network and reach out to that community. And I got chastised severely for coming out as bi, saying there's a time and a place for that. We all go through that. You know, everybody's gone through a bi phase. But, you know, and so I was shocked, because if the HRC isn't a safe place to come out as bisexual, you know, where is? And the last straw for me, um, and I'm skipping years of frustrations, but I think you can probably fill in <laughs> the gaps from things you've heard already, or things you've experienced, unfortunately. I hope not. But um, the last straw for me was there's an annual conference um, of queer lawyers. It's the LGBT Bar Association hosts a conference called Lavender Law every year. And um, Robbie Kaplan, Roberta Kaplan, is one of the lawyers who argued marriage equality to the Supreme Court. And she was the keynote speaker. And she got up there and she said, you know, we really need to stop calling it same-sex marriage. Let's just call it what it is. It is gay marriage because only gays get married. Nobody else gets married in a same-sex relationship. And I just wanted to scream, you know, because this is the keynote speaker at the National LGBT Bar Association saying bisexuals don't get married. We don't exist. Just call it gay marriage. Ironically, right after she spoke, the executive director of the Bar Association said, next year, we're going to be focusing more on diversity and inclusion. How can we improve that? <laughs> so I raised my hand, and I said, can we please start being more bi-inclusive? And um, I was as nice as I could be. I wasn't, <laughs> I, I don't think I was, you know, that obviously angry, but I was frustrated, and it came out, and as soon as that was over, um, a dozen people came up to me and said, thank you for saying that. That's how we've been feeling, too. And that is how by-law was organically created on the spot. That was, um, when the organization began. And the first thing we did was we did lobby the Bar Association for more by programming And it took a lot of nudging at first, but we finally we convinced them that they should actually have panels on bi issues. Can you imagine the LGBT Bar Association conference didn't have any panels at all on bi issues before we fought for it. And we created what was called the Bylaw Caucus, which is now an annual tradition. And every year, 50 to 100 bi lawyers come to this caucus and it is so emotional because everybody's so grateful because, sorry, <laughs> um, just to be around people like them um, and, and to be out and to talk about bi issues. It's, it's a really, um, one of the most moving experiences I've had in my life is just being there once a year and just seeing the gratitude in the room. But, you know, it hurts when you're excluded year after year, panel after panel, conference after conference. Um, one of our earliest accomplishments as an organization was we submitted an amicus brief. Amicus is Latin for basically friend. It means a friend of the court. So if you're submitting an amicus brief to the Supreme Court, you're not one of the parties to the case, but you're saying to the court, look, we have a special perspective that we need you to consider. There's a special issue here that we would like to raise. So we submitted an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief to the Supreme Court, in the marriage equality cases saying, please don't forget about bisexuals, we exist too. And of course, the court ignored us. Um, <laughs> but another federal court didn't. Um, there's at least one federal court out there that took notice and made reference to our brief and in an opinion about a year later said, you know what, we do need to be better about including bisexuals when we write about LGBT rights. But, you know, again, crumbs. That's one opinion out of so many. Um, but that's just a snippet of why I became a bi lawyer. Um, and then, another kind of intro piece, before I get into the substance of the, of the issue, I want to talk about not just why bi, but also why, not, not why I, but why bi. Um, and here I'm going to give a somewhat condensed version of this, because I'm feeling like I'm running a little out of time, and I think this is some bi 101 stuff, 
But if there's time at the end, I'm happy to go over this in more detail with you. But I want to talk about the word bisexual and why it's important. Um, as I'm sure you know by now, being bisexual basically means you're attracted to, you have the potential to be attracted to both your gender and to other genders. Um, that's how the community generally defines bisexuality. There's a lot of more nuanced um, approaches to it. You've got the Kinsey scale um, that you've heard of, right? Everybody Kinsey scale. Um, have you heard of the Klein grid, which is more detailed? Fritz Klein is um, a bisexual activist and scholar who put together a more multi-dimensional model to build on top of the Kinsey scale in a way. Um, and it's a grid that measures sexual orientation by sexual attraction, sexual behavior, fantasies, emotional preference, social preference, um, self-identification, lifestyle preference, and then you put it on a grid according to your past, your present, <laughs> your ideals, and that gives you a more complex way of identifying on this spectrum somewhere um, on the bi spectrum. What's common in all the different approaches is that it recognizes that sexual attraction can be to one's own sex or gender or to others to varying degrees. Um, and the controversial part I'm not going to dwell on because then I won't get to the substance of the lecture, but I'm very much aware that the word bi is not as in vogue as it used to be, um, but I would still implore you to at least take a leap of faith with me and consider that bisexual with the implied plus after it <laughs> works well as an umbrella term and that it encompasses other identities from pansexual to queer to polysexual to I don't believe in labels. Um, I mean a whole lecture, a whole course could be devoted to talking about the different types of identities even within those of us who are not monosexual. Um, but it is important to have an umbrella term. Um, to make sure that we're counted and included and named, whether in court decisions or in the census or research data, because that in turn determines how we get funding and resources are allocated. I see a hand, but can we wait until the end of the lecture for Q&A? Because otherwise I'm afraid I'm not going to get to the, the gist of, okay, cool, thanks. Um, the bi movement, as I mentioned, is woefully underfunded, and one of the reasons is because we're undercounted. Um, so assuming that there are benefits to fighting within the system for change, even if it's pocket change compared to the rest of the movement, um, then even the queerest revolutions need agreed upon universal language, it's important. Um, we need common language to communicate with others, to effectively work within the system, or to even change the system from within. And this is important for legal issues because if the courts are unfamiliar with the very concept of bisexuality, it really can lead to serious life or death consequences to bisexuals who are seeking justice within the legal system. So we need umbrella terms to communicate, educate, and defend our very existence and rights, including to those with power over our lives. Is bisexual the best umbrella term? I know there are some who think no. Um, I'm going to table this, though, and just ask you to take that leap of faith with me, and I'll come back to it if I have time. But I think I can do a pretty good job explaining why bi, to me at least, works as an umbrella term. But that is not at all to invalidate um, pansexual or any other identities that people who are not strictly gay or straight adopt. Um, okay, so the thing about being bisexual <laughs> is, I do want to say this, it is attacked sometimes as the word itself being overly binary sounding, but think about this for a minute. Bisexuality is about being both and, as opposed to being either or. The whole crux of being both and as opposed to either or is that bisexual bisexuality shuns the very notion that there's only two options on how to love. Bisexuality doesn't embrace binary thinking, quite the opposite. We subvert and we challenge binary thinking because we reject either or di dichotomies. So at least under the concept of bi Bisexuals, I'm asking you to kind of <laughs> take a leap of faith and go with me on today. Bisexuality is binary challenging and not binary embracing. It's about being both and. So being a both and kind of person, um, I do think that both and flexibility is preferable to black and white either or oppositional thought. Um, and that's true particularly if bisexuality is understood to have an implied plus. When I say bi, I mean bi plus. I mean including anybody 
who is attracted to more than just um, their own or other genders. And again, I think it's important to have common language, an umbrella term like bisexual, because if we don't have labels and categories, we can't be counted. And enough people, because enough people are willing to be counted as bisexual, in recent years we've begun to have more of an understanding of the disparities faced by bisexuals through responses um, to surveys that then help determine what kind of resources we need. This I meant to put up earlier, but this is kind of the importance of umbrella labels as opposed to individual labels, both and. We should have both, we can have both, we do have both. And I'll just leave that up there for a moment. So because enough people are willing to identify as bisexual to be counted on surveys that are really important, we're able to have data. We know that 52% of people who identify as L, G, or B are B. That doesn't even include people who have other labels. Um, so we're actually a much bigger demographic than that. Um, and we know from the data that we've collected that we're an extremely diverse population. Um, and we also have um, the transgender community and the bisexual community are very much intertwined. We always have been. Um, more people living with disabilities are bisexual, are bisexual than lesbian and gay. Unfortunately, there's a lot of negative disparities. Um, bisexuals are much more disproportionately likely to be victims of domestic violence, um, to have mental health issues, including suicidal um, ideation and attempts. We face higher rates of employment discrimination, and this is compared to lesbians and gays, by the way, this is not compared to the transgender community. The transgender community absolutely has it the worst. But bisexuals do have disproportionately high rates um, of um, also physical health issues. Um, the rape statistic is one of the most shocking. 46% of bi women have been raped as opposed to 17% of heterosexual women and 13% of lesbian women. So we wouldn't have this data, we wouldn't have this information if people weren't willing to identify as bi. So that's one reason it's important. Um, so talking about the history and the harms of bi erasure, um, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this, but I would say that a great place to start if you're willing to read through a kind of dense legal article and it's in the bibliography that I had sent to you guys before this lecture, is an article by a Yale law professor, Kenji Yoshino. He wrote an article called The Epistemic Contract of Bisexual Erasure. And he goes into really fascinating depth talking about why did bi erasure even start? And one of the theories that he has is both gays and straights are really threatened by bisexuals because we challenge that binary thought process, which to some people is really comforting because if you see two people walking down the street holding hands, and they both look like they're men, a straight or a gay person will look at them and say, ah, that's a gay couple, cool. Or maybe they won't say cool, but they'll have that visual identity. I see two men together, they must be gay. Or they'll see what looks like a man and a woman together and say, oh, that's a straight couple. Well, that works <laughs> until you stop and consider our existence. And we throw a wrench in everything because he can't tell from who our partner is what our sexual orientation is. And that takes away some people's artificial, binary, rigid, dichotomous comfort blanket that they like so much. There's a lot of more complex reasons underlying biphobia, but um, I think Yoshina does a good job describing some of it if you're ever in the mood to wade through it. Um, even Kinsey's research, which revealed how fluid sexuality is, how very few people are completely heterosexual or completely homosexual using his terminology. He didn't use the word bisexual in his own research. Um, not to say he erased bi's, but the, the term really hasn't been embraced widely, even by some of the greatest um, scholars on the issue. Even after the bisexual community began, began, began organizing in the 1970s, um, bi invisibility has proliferated not just through more benign omissions, but also through more deliberate erasure, from marches to other actions by the broader LGBTQ movement, um, and in political discourse as well. 
One of my more recent battles um, that I haven't really been successful in fighting is, I'm sure you've heard of these gay and trans panic ban bills, which are wonderful because <laughs> they take away this defense. Um, I think there's 10 states now that have passed them where uh, they've taken away this defense that people too often use in criminal cases where they attack someone who's queer and say, oh, well, it was safe self-defense because I didn't realize they were queer, so of course that was horrible and I had this, you can't use that as a defense anymore under these bills. But why are they just called gay and trans panic bills? Why not buy? Um, I have talked to legislators, I have talked to advocacy organizations, I've finally got the LGBT um, Bar Association to be more inclusive. So they're fighting to be more, to have it be the LGBTQ panic defense bills, which the text of the bills say, so why not put that in the title? Uh, but too many times I'm hearing, well, we don't want to be the first to do it. <laughs> um, and this nervousness about being the first to do it, I think that doesn't fly. Tell that to Kenny um, Paterumos, and I apologize if I'm, misspelling his, if I'm mispronouncing his name, but 10 days ago, he was a bisexual man who was killed for being queer, and his murderer is invoking self-defense. He's bi, you know, bi people get attacked too. They don't stop and ask us first before they beat us up. Oh, I'm sorry, are you bi or gay? If you're bi, I'm not gonna beat you up. You know, it doesn't work like that. So legislative battles are still, we're very much left out, even in the names of bills. But in litigation and court cases, um, that's really been troubling to me as a lawyer. Um, not just a lawyer, but I worked for Lambda Legal, one of the biggest LGBT rights organizations in the country. And it was pooling teeth, trying to get them to be inclusive over the years. Um, well, let me go back to Romer versus Evans. This is the case I mentioned when I was a law student. It was the first big LGBT rights victory. Do people remember that case, anybody? Okay, it's, it's a while back, but basically there's a state amendment that the voters passed into law, and this is what it said. It basically said, homosexuals, lesbians, and bisexuals cannot have civil rights. That's basically what it amounted to. Court struck it down, said you can't single out a class of people like that and just deny them legal protections across the board. That is per se unconstitutional. Okay, great case. Here's the problem. When the LGBT rights lawyers argued that case to the Supreme Court, look at the text, it says bisexual. They said to the court, the only people affected by this amendment are gays and lesbians. So that is the class of people we're talking about. So the face of the briefs to the court literally erased bisexual, and the court opinion, as a result, followed the lead of the LGBT rights lawyers and literally erased bisexuals. From that day forward, the Supreme Court has not mentioned bisexuals in the LGBT rights cases. They did before. So this is the fault of the movement itself being exclusive. Um, so that upset me as a law student. I was thrilled, I was excited by the substance of the decision, and yet at the same time, I'm like, but why was I erased? So for the next 25 years, <laughs> I um, you know, did a deeper dive into that. So my dissertation that I ended up getting advanced law degrees writing about was the marriage issue, but also writing about bisexual exclusion. And you can't see the details of this, but basically, I went through every LGBT rights decision by the courts and every major brief by the advocates, and I counted the word bisexual. And I call this my donuts and crumbs chart because most of all, I mean, you just see zeros across the board. You'll see like 60 references to lesbian, gay, zero to bisexual over and over again. There's maybe one reference to bisexuals, and that's when someone's quoting something. So those are my little crumbs. So that's my donuts and crumbs chart. Um, In the marriage litigation, there is even more blatant strategic bisexual erasure. There was a, okay, you all remember Prop 8, right? Proposition 8 in California, because it's California. Um, in that case, one of the main litigants who was trying to get the right to marry, her name was Sandy Steyer. She was trying to marry her partner, a woman, Chris Perry. She had previously been married to a man. Her own lawyer, Ted Olson, got up there on the stand, gave her the third degree, and he said, because he was trying to preemptively address this, because he knew the other side would, and he was worried about that. So he gets up there, and he questions his own client, and he says, how convinced are you that you're gay? You've lived with a husband. You said you loved him. Some people might say, well, it's this, and then it's that, and then it could be this again. Answer that. 
And her response was to explain away her past marriage, saying she'd never really loved the man, that she'd only really loved women. Regardless of her response, she's entitled to identify however she wants. I won't begrudge her that. But the entire line of questioning is offensive in the implication that if she had been out as a bisexual, she wouldn't be entitled to marriage equality um, unless she's a gold star lesbian. There's like no room at the end for same-sex marriage equality for those of us who are out as bisexual. And the bisexual erasure also extended to media coverage of the marriage issue. When Robin Oakes, she's one of the most prominent bisexual rights activists in history, got married, she was widely reported to be a lesbian. So those are just a couple of examples. Um, even in recent years with the acronym LGBT, LGBTQ, LGBTQIA, wonderful to have an inclusive acronym but sometimes that very acronym is used to erase bisexuals. When a famous bi person comes out, for example, most recently Cory Booker's partner, she, the headlines too often will say, um, famous person comes out as LGBT. Oh, she comes out as bisexual. So it's almost like the acronym is being used as yet another cloak to use instead of the word bisexual. Um, so I ultimately did leave the movement for lack of support for bi rights. Um, in my last year at Lambda Legal, I was told that bisexuality and bi-inclusion and bi-rights just aren't important enough, they're not priority enough, so the funding was taken away. I was told I couldn't go to Lavender Law, and it was the five-year reunion of bylaw caucus, mm, not important, not priority. I said I would find the funds myself, I would put together a grant, and again, no, just not priority enough. So heartbreaking, and Lambda Legal isn't alone. I'm not aware of any other LGBT rights legal, move, legal organization that prioritizes bi issues and gives it funding. Bi advocacy remains grossly under-resourced and underfunded. And I'm afraid that that's gonna continue to be the case and we're gonna continue to be erased in the future Supreme Court decisions that are coming up in June. Why does it matter? How much time do I have? Five minutes or 10 minutes? 10, okay. I'll try to go through this quickly. Here's why it matters, and I usually start off with this. Um, there's two big examples in the legal context of why by inclusion is harmful. <clears throat> Custody and asylum. Let me just leave you, you know, with these two thoughts more than anything in this presentation. There are cases where bisexuals have been seeking asylum from countries where they would be persecuted for their sexual orientation. The asylum adjudicators didn't understand bisexuality was a valid sexual orientation, so they turned them away, sent them back to their home countries where they can be you know, persecuted, violently even killed. There is one case in the UK where because a bisexual man had had a relationship with a woman, the asylum adjudicator said, well, then obviously you're not gay. He's like, no, I'm bisexual. I can be persecuted for my sexual orientation. They didn't believe him until he gave them pornographic pictures of himself being intimate with his male partner. That's what it took. Can you imagine <laughs> a straight couple having to go through that before they're granted relief and, and immigration rights? Um, custody is another example. I used to do family law work, and way too often, um, bisexuals who have been married in a different sex marriage get divorced, enter into a same-sex relationship, they lose their kids because the custody judges, again, don't understand that bisexuality is valid and they equate it with instability. You were with the man and now you're with the woman, well that can't be good for the children, okay? So really, the harms of bi erasure are serious and they're life and death, you know, threatening. And there's intangible harms. Again, just the stigma and the, the sadness we experience of being omitted by our own community. Um, the perpetuation of miscommunication, of, of misinformation. Um, this is harmful to really the legal system as a whole. And it's hypocritical for the LGBTQ movement, on the one hand, to be fighting against second-class citizenship and then doing that to its own. Uh, there are, I wish I had more time, <laughs> because then there's, there is overlap between the polyamorous community and the bi community. I'm a monogamous bisexual. There's a lot of monogamous bisexuals. You can be monogamous and be bisexual, which makes it kind of hard to talk about this issue. A lot of people don't want to. But there is overlap, because there are a number of bi people who validly, um, you know, want to be with per either one more person or, you know, potentially one more gender, 
And they have non-traditional family structures that are not protected under the law. I mean, these days, polyamorous, non-traditional families are back where same-sex couples were before marriage equality. There's a lot of work that needs to be done there legally. Um, I am proud that I do have, uh, I do have a friend, Diana Adams, who I'm proud to know, who is very active in the bi movement. She's also active in the polyamorous community. She's a lawyer. She helps create legal agreements to protect non-traditional family structures. You know, there's only really one of her in the country that does the work to the level she does. There needs to be a lot more of that. So if any of you are thinking about going to law school, this could be a really fun area to go into. Um, <coughs> so I'm fast forwarding a bit more. The reciprocal side of the harms of bi erasure or the benefits of bi inclusion. Um, being bi inclusive helps everybody. It really helps society as a whole because if you look at things through a bi lens, you're not stuck in a zero sum mentality. You're not stuck in a really rigid, dichotomous, you know, either or black and white world. And it's not just bisexual, it's really the BT, I think, of the LGBT movement. The bi, and I mean plus, and trans plus, gender fluid, what have you. Those of us who are deconstructing gender and sexual identity and saying, you know, there's more than two options out there. Um, we illustrate the beauty and the benefits of embracing the gray, gray areas of life. And in the legal context, I think this makes us good advocates. I do think it can make us potentially good judges too, but there's only two out by judges in the country, and uh, we're going to change that also. But because of being able to see things through that lens that isn't scared of gray areas, that is able to appreciate more than one side of things, um, I'd say that we make the ideal judges in a sense, um, because our whole legal system is based on the fact that you can have two sides to an issue, and if one of them were completely, absolutely wrong, the case would be thrown out from the start as frivolous. I mean, there's always more than one side of an issue. So, um, bisexuals can also help advance specific legal arguments. Um, one example is in the marriage context, I would tell people, and I had this in an article, we had this in our brief to the court. When I was living in Indiana, where marriage wasn't legal yet, if I went to the clerk of courts and I said, hi, I'm bisexual, this is my female partner, we want to get married, is that okay? They'd say, well, no, because we don't recognize same-sex marriage. If I go to that same clerk and say, hi, I'm bisexual, this is a man, I'd like to marry him, is that okay? Well, sure, of course, we have heterosexual traditional marriage here. What's changed in that equation? Not my sexual orientation. The only thing that's changed is the gender of the person I want to marry. So bisexuals illustrate that sexual orientation discrimination is a form of sex discrimination. Why is that important? That is the issue in front of the Supreme Court right now. That's important because under a number of laws in this country, under the Constitution, under federal civil rights laws, sex discrimination is protected. So even if sexual orientation isn't spelled out under the law, sex discrimination is, once you realize, and bisexuals, I think, can help illustrate that it's a form of sex discrimination, then we get legal protection. Same thing works in the employment context, and that is exactly the issue that's in front of the Supreme Court right now. So <laughs> once again, I was a squeaky wheel, reached out to all my contacts in the legal community. I said, you're going to be making this argument to the Supreme Court, right? You're going to be including bisexuals, right? Because we actually strengthened your argument. Lambda Legal did. They actually did put my argument in their brief, but the main lawyers didn't. I'm not going to hold my breath counting on the Supreme Court to include us. But that's an example, and there are others, of how we actually help strengthen arguments. Um, in general, we also help um, consistency. To be bi-inclusive is to be consistent, is to not contradict yourself. As an LGBT rights activist, when you talk about the importance of liberty and choice and all of these principles that bisexuals embody, um, there is so much more that I would like to say but I'm out of time, I would implore you, at the very least, bisexual is not a dirty word. Please don't be afraid of it. Please use it. That's a big part of all I'm asking for here. Um, am I out of, out of time? No Q&A? OK, five minutes for questions. <laughs> Oh, 
Yeah. Fritz Klein, K L E I N. Yeah. Fritz Klein. He did the multifaceted grid that gives you different ways of measuring sexual orientation beyond just the Kinsey scale. Oh, by the way, here's a couple more things. If you wanted to advance bisexuality in a legal context, Invisible Majority Report, I would strongly urge reading it. It goes into detail talking about how to include bisexuals in specific policy measures. Um, also, please consider in actively inviting bi groups um, and bisexuals into your advocacy. Invite us, reach out to us. Um, and again, bi plus, that includes pan, that includes you know, anybody who doesn't identify strictly as lesbian or, or straight or gay. Other questions? Yeah. For bisexuals specifically, or? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, polyamorous people. Okay, so that's what you're asking about poly people. Um, yeah, I would recommend going to Diane, do a Google search for Diana Adams, um, plus lawyer or bisexual or poly. And what, it's not that she's accomplished a lot as far as getting laws passed, but there are a lot of legal protections in the form of contractual agreements that she's been able to come up that people can use as models and that kind of thing. Um, there are some, you know, states that have third-party adoption options that can be, you know, available to polyamorous families, but it's very piecemeal, very state by state. But I would suggest looking at Diana Adams' work because um, she has a really great website where she spells everything out in detail, both the issues and solutions. Any other questions? I, you know what, I'm not following specifically what's happening in Utah right now, and I apologize. I'm not as in touch as I would have been. Um, but, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's a whole other issue. But, but, I mean, I used to be challenged on that when I would talk about the importance of marriage equality. You know, I'd have conservatives challenging me and say, well, what about polygamy? Won't it lead to polygamy? I'm, well, yeah. I mean, honestly, what's so magical about two, right? Um, so. If you think about the constitutional basis for our rights, it's about the right to make our most intimate personal life decisions by ourselves without government interference. Problem with polygamy is it gets complicated because there's legal structures that you would have to change and it would, it would be messy. But in theory, I don't know why constitutionally polyamorous and polygamous family structures shouldn't have some kind of protection. Um, and then again, that's where buys can be a bridge. Is you know, we can help people kind of expand their scope and ways of looking at things beyond our normal rigid dichotomous way of looking at things. Yeah. Um, sure, yeah. I'll, I'll send you my slide that you can distribute to your students. Sure. Oh, actually, yeah. Yes, so absolutely. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for coming.